Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 6 of the Say La Vie podcast. We are at the halfway point of this series, so you know what that means. Now's the time to go big or go home, so we're going to be kicking it up a notch, starting with this week's episode celebrating Pride Month. We're going to be engaging in an awesome conversation with Liana Kusmono about their poetry under the guise of By Curious George. Liana and I will dive into a conversation on allyship and how we can best support each other in the ways that make all of us feel comfortable. Now this idea of allyship is different for each community, so it's important to do research and inform yourself on what are the best ways you can help the communities you'd love to support. Which is why in this episode description, we are gonna be providing you a list of resources of small businesses and local artists, part of the LGBTQ plus community that are doing incredible work. At the end of this episode, I'm gonna be running down some really awesome services that are available to LGBTQ plus members around this province that are looking for additional help or need someone to talk to. It seems that with every episode we inch closer to giving you a bigger picture every single time of what Quebec's mosaic really looks like. Now I could have a hundred, maybe even a thousand of these episodes and I still won't be able to explore every intricate community or their intricate lived experiences throughout the province. But that in itself is so beautiful and it's a representation of the sheer diversity we have across these regions. And I say it all the time, we are a mosaic in this province. We are filled with different identities, cultures, people, and that just makes us who we are. And each voice is just as responsible and as valuable for making this province what it is. So without further ado, let's jump into our first artist of the day, Georgette, performing her song, La Mal. Plus j'en demande, plus les gens me parlent Plus les gens me parlent, plus j'en apprends sur le mal Pourquoi personne ne m'a averti Mes chants laissent en poche, mais au moins c'est appris Moi, je fais quoi Je te pardonne Peut-être, peut-être pas I won't fix it, I can't fix you I won't fix it, I can't fix you I won't fix it, I can't fix you Plus j'en demande, plus les gens me parlent Plus les gens me parlent, plus j'en apprends sur le mal Pourquoi personne ne m'a averti Mes chants laissent en poche, mais au moins c'est appris Moi, je fais quoi Je te pardonne, peut-être, peut-être pas I won't fix it, I can't fix you Peut-être pas I won't fix it I can't fix you I won't fix it I can't fix you I can't fix you You told me you were good Boy, you were good You had me on your hook I had you covered But it's all out of hand now You're out of hand now I wanna tell the world I wanna tell your mom I wish I could say her son is getting better I wish I could tell it to your eyes How come I don't see your eyes? We were there, we were there for the whole time Boy, you got us good Boy, you got me good You had me on your hook I had you covered That thing you do Liana, I'm going to let you introduce yourself to everyone and talk a bit about the amazing work you do, and let's jump right into it. 
All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for having me here today. My name is Liana Canton Cusmano, and I use they, them pronouns. I'm a writer, a poet, a filmmaker, and a spoken word artist. I love to combine the personal and the political with my poetry. And so I'm also an arts educator and the president of the Green Party of Canada. And the things that I'm most passionate about are really combining working with young people, especially in politics and especially in the arts and seeing how I can marry those two things to create a sense of community. And I've been doing that for, for a few years now, but I've been writing since I was really young and I've been politically engaged since I was quite young. So that's, this is all, it's been a long time coming. That's really, really cool. Uh, one of the things that intrigues me most about that is is your work at the uh, the Green Party of Canada. Tell me a bit more about that. That sounds super interesting. I actually ran as a candidate with the Green Party for the first time in 2019. My dad also ran as a candidate. So we, we sort of tag teamed in that way in the city of Montreal. And that was my introduction to an election campaign as a candidate, as opposed to someone who was involved and who was informed and who had opinions about it. But it was my first time really being a member of a party and running under that party's banner. And I thought, you know, this might be this thing that I decide to do because I care about the issues and because I've met so many wonderful people. And, you know, maybe this will be this, this thing that I did when I was 24 and it was fun. I, remained very, very involved with the party. I worked on uh, a leadership campaign in the Green Party leadership contest. I ran for a position on the national governing board and I had originally run as a youth representative and then a vacancy opened up and I'm now the president. Now, I love that you were talking about how you combine these worlds of politics into your poetry uh, because I find like with a lot of art, your life imitates art and art imitates life so in a lot of ways the things you're passionate about really play into your art so we're going to be hearing a bit of liana's poetry later on in this episode so that's going to be really exciting and you want to talk a bit about your poetry and some of the work you do there i've been writing poetry since i was a kid and it's only and i grew up in a family of artists and writers who have always been very very supportive and very encouraging of me and of my my creative pursuits and I had always sort of kept poetry on the page and it's only in the last few years that I learned about spoken word and that I started doing spoken word because it's very, there's a big difference between writing something for the page and keeping it to yourself or knowing that other people will read it on their own and taking something written expressly to be performed and then actually performing it and presenting it to an audience. Mm -hmm. So I think that for so many people who are, you know, part of marginalized communities or who are from equity seeking groups, um, their existence and the way they move through the world is a political act and is a statement of resistance. And there is so much that can be said about that and about the systems that we live in and the change that we're fighting for and the kind of world that we wanna see. And so as a young non-binary queer millennial who looks and presents and was raised as a woman, I have um, some experience in the queer community and outside the queer community because I think, you know, there's a difference between knowing yourself as a queer individual and then coming into yourself as a member of that community once you've discovered it, once you've accepted who you are, once you've started to form bonds with other people. And so poetry for me was a way of really processing that. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my poetry is, I guess you could say, quote unquote, queer poetry or queer Italian Canadian poetry, because those intersections of identity are things that I, that I find really interesting and that are really, there's so much to unpack there. There are mm -hmm. so many things to say. And I've met so many Italian Canadians and queer people and queer Italian Canadians who feel similarly that there's a lot to say about the politics of who we are and the communities that we're a part of. So that's what my poetry touches on. I also write like, you know, sad love poems and who really, <laughs> that's it really gay, sad love poems, really bisexual, sad love poems. And, and that's the thing. That's another part of it. So many of us are drawn to poems or artwork or content that's um, that's sad or that dips into something traumatic because we all need a way to process those feelings and we feel closer to those who, who have had the same experiences as us. And so I think one challenge that I've tried to set for myself and that I would like to see more 
um, from especially young poets and young queer poets, and this is a challenge, is to write distinctly um, and enthusiastically happy poems. And that's difficult. And they score poorly at competitions. Mm -hmm. But it's really something to, to write something that is still political and still personal, and that's got joy in it. I, I took a creative writing course at Concordia last semester, and I've been writing poetry for a long time, but that really kicked in, in some, some something into my brain that just like a, a, a switch flipped because I read, mm -hmm. a, I read the book 365 plays, 365 days written by mm -hmm. Suzanne Laurie Parks. And that inspired me to write 365 days, 365 poems. And I don't think I'm actually going to release Very that in cool. a book, but I've been trying to write poetry every single day. I'm trying to come up with some, some form of thing. And what I've been noticing is I am learning a lot about myself by the stuff that I kind of psychosomatically write on the page, you know, and it, yes. it's cool that we kind of um, dive into these thoughts and these parts of our minds that we hadn't really explored. And then when you read it over it, like, it hurt, like it, it takes something out of you. Like when it, when something feels like it's gut wrenching, it's it, you didn't think you had it in you to write that. So That's how right. important is that for for artists to kind of learn learn about themselves from that? How integral was that in your growth? I think it's really, really important. I think that's why so many young writers and young artists, especially teenagers, you can tell when something is quote unquote adolescent and it's something that it's a way to describe people's work that's a little bit negative, like, oh, that's so adolescent, that's so juvenile. Um, and I think it can be used negatively, which is unfortunate because when you're young, when you're a little bit juvenile and when you're an adolescent, you are still discovering yourself and coming into yourself as a person and as an artist. So obviously you'll write about what you know, obviously you'll write or you'll write about something or someone that you're getting to know, which happens to be yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's as artists grow and evolve that they start to broaden their scope a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I look back on some of the poetry that I wrote as a teenager or some of the poetry that my, my colleagues or my friends wrote as teenagers. And you're like, Oh my God, this is so, angsty and dramatic and self-centered and that's just how it is because that's who we were at the time that's how we we wrote and so when you get older and you start to move differently through the world and you gain more experience there are more things that I find myself wanting to comment on or more mm -hmm. things that I'm noticing and that's the thing my I can only speak for myself I can only write from my own perspective I think it's important also as a poet and as an individual to stay in your lane there are some topics that maybe you shouldn't touch on mm -hmm. Um, your allyship should be, you know, subtle. It should be strong, but subtle and discreet, I think. Mm -hmm. And so definitely any and, you know, all of my work is very much rooted in a sense of self, in a queer sense of self, in a feminized sense of self. And so that perspective definitely still informs all of my work, even when it's not necessarily about me. It's, it's really cool that you were able to find that, that kind of introspection from your poetry. Another really cool thing about your poetry is your name. I think that when, when I was sent the list of names from QWF of, of poets that they recommended me, and I saw By Curious George, I was like, that's, that's a brilliant name. So let's talk a bit about that. What inspired that name? I participated, it was my first time at the Canadian Festival of Spoken Word in 2018, and I went there with the Montreal Throw Poetry Collective team, and we competed and we made it to the semifinals, and it was my first time at CFSW, and it was Halloween, and there was a little sort of antique curio shop, and in the window was this stuffed sort of Curious George mm -hmm. toy. And there was a little sign that said, by Curious George. And there was something else. I think it was a Bible and the little tag to describe the item was something like, read this for, you know, to do all of the things that everybody else is telling you not to, but that you should still do or something like that. Like it was a store with, you know, different items with a lot of character. And I mm -hmm. saw by Curious George and I was like, this is, you know, it's, and that's the thing. And I was wondering, is there copyright here that I should be worried about? But I don't. I don't think so. Um, I've, I came out as bisexual in my late teens. And I think that gender is a social construct and an innate sense of self and identity at the same time. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of scholarship. There is a lot of commentary and discourse to be had on sex and gender and sexual orientation. But the combination and, and sort of um, arbitrariness of femininity and masculinity is something that has interested me for a long time. 
And so to take this, you know, decidedly male character and to spin it into a stage name Mm -hmm. was something that I thought was really interesting. And I remember one of my colleagues, one of my teammates being like, you know, keep in mind when you, when someone introduces you as an artist, you know, using the name by Curious George is going to set a different tone than using, let's say, you know, your, your birth name or your legal name. So are you sure that you want to go by by Curious George? And I was like, look, we can talk about any number of all the names and stage names that poets have. And they range from, you know, really solemn and really interesting and serious to like absolutely totally ridiculous, you know? So, Mm -hmm. and that's just a decision that each of us makes. And I think it makes sense. It's a creative choice. That's right. It's a creative choice. Exactly. So if my poems are about, you know, feeling like you're at the bottom of a, a deep pit and you've been there for a decade, I think it's a cool and probably, you know, required contrast to have a stage name like by Curious George. I'm really grateful to have gone to school downtown Montreal because I feel like that allowed me to be really educated about a lot of these LGBT issues and just the culture of asking people their pronouns and that kind of stuff was really promoted at Dawson a lot Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I think that really helped me understand a lot of these things but it saddens me to see that not a lot of people understand right not a lot of people were educated in this way and we are getting there there is some progress but um, there's still horrible, nasty comments everywhere and by people the same age. And it's it's saddening to see for, for my friends that are part of that community. And just, you know, on the level of we're all human beings. So what kind of issues do you see that should be more brought into light? I think that one sort of accusation that's leveled at the Green Party is that we're a one issue party. And all we care about is the fact that the planet is, you know, we're in a state of environmental collapse. And there are there are some you know there is the argument that well if environmental collapse and the planet and the environment is the most important thing then we shouldn't talk about like let's say these fringe issues like pronouns and you know social justice and stuff like that and i think that's that's absurd because of course there is no economy there is no social framework there is no social safety net without a place to live however environmental justice and social justice are completely inseparable. The two of them go together because if you look at the state of environmental collapse, or if you look at, you know, a public health crisis like COVID-19, the people who are the most affected are the people who are already the most marginalized. It's a privilege to be able to stay at home if you can work from home. It's a privilege to be able to isolate if you don't have to go to whatever job or go to whatever, you know, place of work, because that's what your your circumstances are, your position and your wealth and your privilege makes that possible for you. And not everybody has that. Mm-hmm. So COVID-19, especially, and all sorts of other um, environmental and public health catastrophes really exacerbate those inequalities. And so, you know, people of color or trans people are more likely to be affected by the housing crisis or the climate crisis or, you know, high unemployment or issues of examples of like blatant discrimination. So all of those issues are are tied together and I don't think that we can separate them and I don't think that we should separate them. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and it's, it's so important to get young people involved and engaged. I think so many of us are disillusioned. That was what happened when I, you know, was thinking about joining the party, I was like, this is, you know, this is pointless, you know, we will all die, let's just white knuckle it and, you know, kill time as quickly as we can until that happens. And that was an indicator of my own privilege, actually, that I could say, well, why don't we just, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, The world is awful. And human civilization is a mistake. Um, Those of us who can do something about it, I think, we, we should. I think it's a moral obligation to the, the communities that we live in and the society that we all take part in, that those of us who can ought to do something. And it's difficult because young people are also usually not as privileged. You know, when you ask people if they'll be politically engaged or if they have time to be politically engaged, you know, the res- I can understand the response being what in this economy? Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, buying a home in the suburbs, or not having any student debt or having, you know, a stable job in the gig economy in some of the biggest cities in Canada. That's not, you know, the world that our parents lived in and that many of us were raised to live in doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. 
So that kind of negotiation is something that a lot of people deal with. And so it's difficult to convince people to get politically engaged, but we don't need, you know, we have enough cishet, middle-aged white people in positions of power to show us the way things have been done and to guide us with their experience and their insight, because I think that's valuable, but we need more diverse and um, representative bodies of government, I mm -hmm. think, because this, we're not going to solve the problems that we have now with the same tools and skills that we used to get here. Mm -hmm. so I think it's important to remember that and it's important to mobilize as much as we can and spread awareness as much as we can and encourage one another as much as we can. You touched on this point of allyship. A lot of people that want to do something sometimes maybe take it a bit far. What's a comfortable position? What action can they take to, um, you know, continue to support this allyship, but not, not cross that line? Oh, that's a good question. That's a really good question because I think it's different for everybody and it's different for every community and every social group or every equity seeking group. I think that one mistake that so many of us make is expect um, our friends or our colleagues to educate us about their struggles and say, well, you know, I want to help you, but how can I do that if I don't know what to do? And I expect you to, to tell me what to do. I think if you, if, you know, there's this concept of spoons, like how many spoons do you have? How much energy do you have to expend on certain things? If you have a member, you know, if you run into someone who has the spoons to do that, and to explain the way the systems we live in are oppressive to them or to explain how you can help and how you can sort of wield your privilege. That's great. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that any of us should expect others to educate us. And that's the thing. And sometimes we fall into that difficult position of, well, okay, I have a responsibility to educate myself and to decide, you know, here are the businesses that I can support or here are the um, organizations that I can contribute to. Here are the protests that I can contribute a body to sometimes people just need bodies at sites of you know protest or or conflict mm -hmm. and we're we're all going to make mistakes that's the thing if your allyship is problematic um or you know needs to be changed it means you're doing something mm -hmm. and so i think it's also i think it's important to be grateful for the people who sort of redirect us and who say look i can see that you're trying but this comment that you made is not appropriate or this action that you're taking with the best of intentions isn't having the impact that you want. Mm -hmm. So, and that, con that constructive criticism is constructive criticism. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, telling you that you're a terrible person and that your allyship is worthless. It's just, I'm going to help you redirect mm -hmm. real quick. I consider that a favor for someone to say, you made this comment um, and it's prejudicial and discriminatory. And I think that that's, we we should be grateful for those opportunities. Yeah. So that's the thing. I think we, we need to educate ourselves as best we can. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to navigate more to towards correcting that miscommunication because I feel a lot of times when people are, are making an effort to be allies, right? To, to make an effort to be better in their lives, to be accepting of these things. And then something happens in which someone, as you mentioned, will come up to them and correct them and be like, hey, look, they will take that as an attack rather than taking that as... A correction and an, and an appreciation. I think there needs to be a, uh, I think there needs to be a, a correction in this, in the context of this conversation. We should help each other grow rather than feeling attacked when someone's trying to correct our perception of the world. Because in those instances, we are teaching each other about our struggles. In those instances of, of correcting people on, on small, on small mistakes they may be making while talking, that is your education. That is you teaching based on experience what can be done to improve. So maybe we should embrace that and allow ourselves to learn from each other's experience when we're not expecting it. Exactly. I think that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's that's wonderful. I think we had um, a great conversation here today. I want to thank you very much for being a part of the podcast and joining us and having a wonderful conversation. I want to ask you, where can the people find your poetry and all the great stuff you do? Oh my goodness. The people can find me on Instagram at L underscore Canton Cusmano, where I combine Green Party politics and my curious George queer poetry. And that's probably the best place. You can also find me just with my name on Facebook. Um, I am growing the Twitter, 
but the Twitter is a cesspool based on everything that I've heard. And so I'm not quite sure how I feel about that yet, but Instagram and Facebook are, are good places to go. And as always, we're going to have all of those links down in the description, wherever you're hearing this podcast. Thank you, Liana. Truly appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Before we dive into some of the resources, let's take a look at Liana's poetry. To wander aimlessly at night alone in the wintertime is to look for something that is easier to see when there isn't any light. Some problems are best solved in the dark, in the razor-sharp feedback loops of my own frozen thoughts. But when I come home to her and cut my whole body around hers, I remember that this slow burn will steam every harsh season from my skin. Our lamp watches from the bedside table as I fold myself against her, every shining strand of her hair a metaphor in words I haven't found yet. That screaming fire, the one that fills every closet, feels like an almost other life. I wish I could tell my teenage self, heartbroken, eyes fixed on the changing room floor, that someday their lover would be a star they could stare at with impunity. A lightning strike half asleep in an old t-shirt, a firelight spooned against their chest. Some things are easier to see in the dark. I trail sparks over her skin. I reach over and turn off the light. Thank you, Liana, for an incredible performance and a wonderful conversation. I learned a lot today, and I truly hope you did too. But the learning's not over yet, friends. Now I wanted to jump into a discussion of some of the great resources that are available for you here in this province if you need it. The first resource I wanted to discuss was the LGBT Plus Family Coalition, recommended by Liana. This coalition does tremendous work and has over 40,000 trained professionals. They distribute thousands of resource kits in over 17 regions across this province. Their workshops help a diverse array of LGBTQ plus members, from families, new parents, to people struggling with everyday transphobia or homophobia or even racism. This organization is very well-rounded and provides a lot of diverse support. Another resource that was suggested by Liana is Jeunesse Lambda. It is an organization that is made and for LGBTQ plus youth across this province. They have a gender accessories and prosthetic accessibility program aimed to provide trans people between the ages of 14 and 25 in the greater Montreal area with items such as compression shirts, gaffs, packers and harnesses, and much much more. This next resource on my list is one of my personal favorites. It's called Rock Camp Montreal, and it is a and it is a camp for music aimed at creating a safe space for members of the LGBTQ+, where they can explore their identity through music, through rock music, and I think this is a wonderful initiative. This list can go on and on and on, but this resource list is packed with incredible initiatives and amazing artists from the LGBT community, so I really hope you take the time to go and show your support to these amazing initiatives and these amazing people that are working hard for their communities. As easy as it is to get lost with some of these buzzwords, it's important to keep in mind that we're all human, and despite all of the differences that we have, we all go through that very real human experience of facing challenges that help define who we are. And so I believe it's truly important to continue educating ourselves with these conversations and learning about the people that live right next to us in our own communities. Because at the end of the day, we're all trying to achieve that same goal. We all want to feel that sense of belonging. We all want to find our sense of identity. And so what better way to achieve that than to achieve that together? So with that, friends, I'll leave you. To end our episode off today, we're going to be hearing a song from Madeline called Late Night Text. But always remember, you are the culture. We are the culture. So go out there and keep making your voices heard so we can keep growing upon this ever-changing mosaic that is the Quebec identity. You die Like me I just feel the void You don't like me, hell You're just a boy Oh, close away. Oh, 
circles caving into themselves Predictability killing me I feel it, it's the same every time I can't wait forever for a late night death take the time to thank Canadian Heritage for continuing to support these episodes, and I want to thank you for keeping these voices heard. I also wanted to say a special thank you to Liana Cusmono, Georgette, and Madeline for providing their incredible performances to this podcast. You can find their links as well as all the links for all the resources mentioned in this episode and many, many more in the description of wherever you're hearing this podcast. And on a final note, never hesitate to reach out if there's any issues you feel need awareness or need to be spoken about. I'm grateful for the supportive community we've been able to foster with this project so far, and I'm excited to continue. So with that, friends, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.